G'day and salutations. Today's briefing, Australia's new Navy. Which vessels? How many? As a result of the Defence Strategic Review, the DSR, see separate briefing link below, the Royal Australian Navy, or RAN, quote, must be optimised for operating in Australia's immediate region and for the security of sea lines of communication and maritime trade, unquote. The new surface force would have enhanced capability in long-range strike against both maritime and land targets, air defence and anti-submarine warfare. The DSR recommended that the future surface combatant force be split into tiers, with Tier 2 comprising a larger number of smaller vessels than those in Tier 1. The DSR reinforced this point by calling for a further review this time into the Navy's surface combatant fleet capability to ensure its size, structure and composition complemented the capabilities provided by the forthcoming conventionally armed nuclear powered attack submarines. This review will describe the two tiers of surface combat vessels. This briefing will look at which vessels might make up the Royal Australian Navy's surface combatant force across the two tiers and how many of each vessel there will be. It will begin with an update on Australia's acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines, as this impacts the surface combatant force. Now, during this briefing, I will use the term corvette to refer to a combat vessel of between 1,500 and 3,000 tonnes. The most talked about new addition to the Royal Australian Navy is the introduction of nuclear-powered attack submarines, or SSNs. At this stage, the plan is to lease three Virginia-class SSNs from the US, two second-hand and one new build, with the possibility of a further two for a total of five. The first boat would arrive in 2033. Australia would then build the SSN AUKUS, effectively a modified British SSNR, R being replacement to the existing astute class, that would include a US combat system and weapons, with the first to arrive sometime in the 2040s. The number of SSNs Australia will build might be anywhere from three to eight, as the government's position is that there will be a fleet of eight SSNs, not necessarily all SSN AUKUS. While the submarine is still being designed, we should expect it to be a highly capable boat. Moving to the surface combatant fleet, the only existing vessels that we know with certainty will be part of the future force are the Hobart class air warfare destroyers, and DDGs of which there are three. There's been some talk after concerns uh, being raised regarding the Hunter class FFGs that more Hobart class DDGs might be the answer. But there is nothing official at this stage. Additional air warfare destroyers would be consistent with one of the DSR's critical capability elements concerning improved air defense. The Hobarts are equipped with 48 VLS cells, eight surface-to-surface -surface missiles, a five-inch gun, one helicopter, and a crew of around 200. And they are a tier one force. The other component of the tier one force will be the Hunter class FFGs, frigates. Originally to consist of nine ships, it is this program that is likely the focus of the review into the surface combatant fleet. One of the criticisms of the Hunters is its small number of VLS cells. The Hunters are equipped with 32 VLS cells, eight surface-to-surface -surface missiles, a five-inch gun, and one helicopter as standard, although a second can be carried in a unique fashion and requires a crew of around 180. Its focus is anti-submarine warfare. The review may reduce the final number of Hunters to be procured to as low as three. What could already be labelled as Tier 2 vessels are the Arafura class OPVs or offshore patrol vessels. Now they are a significant step up from the preceding patrol craft, but again have been criticised for being under-equipped. The current plan is for 12 Arafuras in the OPV role and further hulls modified to fill specialist roles such as mine countermeasure and survey. At 1,640 tonnes, they are armed only with a 25mm gun. 
require a crew of 40 and have a 4,000 nautical mile range. Now, they could be more heavily armed, but its size would limit the, the scope and variety of upgrades. In order to achieve more hulls that can operate further from Australia, that is likely further than the OPV's 4,000 nautical miles, there have been proposals for corvettes to re-enter Royal Australian Navy service. Also, noting the intention is that the new amphibious force is to launch its vessels from Darwin and Townsville, projecting out into the region as they transit through the Southeast, Southeast Asian archipelago, a corvette-sized vessel could be utilised to escort the landing craft releasing the Tier 2 vessels for higher threat environments. Any new vessel to fill this role needs to be in the Goldilocks zone. If too big, it will likely be expensive and then the RAND would not be get the numbers required, which appears the whole aim of the review. Too small and the vessels won't be capable enough in terms of weapon systems and range slash endurance. Remembering, the vessels need to contribute across the three warfighting domains. This might result in a vessel of between 1,500 and 3,000 tonnes, armed with surface-to-air and surface-to-surface -surface missiles, good self-protection and any submarine warfare capabilities. Whether these vessels are also required to be able to conduct long-range strike remains to be seen. Such a capability could be achieved by a vessel with a crew of around 60 and range of 6,000 nautical miles, comparable to the current Anzac class frigates. So some options for a two-tiered surface combatant fleet are as follows. Uh, assumption, at least three Hunter class FFGs will be procured. And note the current plan is for three Hobart class air warfare destroyers, DDGs, nine Hunter class anti-submarine warfare destroyers, uh, frigates, FFGs, and 12 Arafura class offshore patrol vessels, OPVs. So option one is for three Hobart DDGs and three Hunter FFGs, giving six tier one vessels together with 18 Corvettes. So there'd be no Arafura class offshore patrol vessels in this option. The pros, well, significantly more and more capable Tier 2 vessels, the upgrade from the OPVs to the Corvettes as suggested previously. The cons, a well, low, low number of Tier 1 vessels, only 6 against the current projected 12, and significantly less anti-submarine warfare capability. Normally here in an assessment I would talk about risk and cost, although this is difficult as we have no idea what any potential Corvette would be although this would likely be a lower cost than other options. Option 2 has two subparts. Option 2A would be three Hobart class air warfare destroyers and six Hunter class anti-submarine warfare frigates, so given nine tier one vessels. Option 2B would be the reverse of this with six Hobart class air warfare destroyers and three Hunter class any submarine warfare frigates, so still giving nine tier one vessels. Both sub options come with 15 corvettes, again, no offshore patrol vessels. The pros, well, a possible increase in air warfare capability and significantly more capable tier two vessels. The cons, would be less tier one vessels than the current plan, nine instead of 12, and some degradation of any submarine warfare capability. Again, risk and cost is difficult to determine, although this is likely a more expensive option than option one, but more capable. The final option, option three, would be six Hobart class air warfare destroyers and six Hunter class anti-submarine warfare frigates. So maintaining 12 tier one vessels and 12 up-armored Arafura class OPVs. So no upgrade to Corvettes, but a limited upgrade to the Arafura class. The pros, as I said, maintains the 12 tier one vessels that is part of the current plan, improves air warfare capability, and improves somewhat, although limited, the combat capability of the current tier two vessels. The cons, there's a significant capability gap between tier one and tier, tier two vessels, and some degradation of any submarine warfare capability. 
while perhaps lower risk, it is likely the most expensive option. Note, if the Arafura uh, offshore patrol vessels are to be replaced, they might be given to border force or converted to mine countermeasure and or survey vessels. In summary, the Australian government has stated that it wants an enhanced lethality surface fleet. This is further explained as that the Navy must provide layered integrated air and missile defence capability, long range strike against maritime and land targets, and anti-submarine warfare capabilities. Now there is a trend in world navies towards operating a larger number of smaller vessels rather than a few large, very capable but expensive vessels that require large crews. However, these smaller vessels must still be able to contribute across these three warfighting domains. If Australia wants a larger number of surface vessels that can operate further out into this area of primary defence interest, that can contribute to the surface battle and be able to protect themselves in a contested environment against air and subsurface threats, they will need to introduce a vessel in the Goldilocks zone between offshore patrol vessels and frigates, that is, corvettes. That concludes today's briefing. Thank you for watching. Happy to take suggestions for future briefings from subscribers, so please subscribe, like, and share. Until next time, Vale de Cerro.